So yeah, today it's a, it's a great pleasure to, um, like the morning went really well, so it's a great pleasure to, to welcome the four panelists today and um, to sort of put a title on, on what we're going to discuss is, is probably slightly impossible, but if I can kind of maybe outline some of the themes, um, partly um, looking at issues of gender-based violence, uh, misogyny, misogynistic language, um, barriers to women's full participation in society and, uh, and in politics, um, the safety of women. Um, and for me, uh, the obligation of, of us men to challenge other men on their behaviors or attitudes and to be part of the solution and to uh, build coalitions with, with women uh, to create a more inclusive, uh, respectful and participatory society um you know and and what has that got to do with the climate change it, there's a huge link i mean obviously social justice is climate justice is 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 feminism in, in forms a lot of the reading i did over the years was was eco-feminism and that's a very strong vein in in a, in environmental thought and women are at the coalface particularly in the global south of climate change um so look, without further ado, um, I just want to signal as well, because, because some of the, the subjects matters we will be dealing with today may be um, difficult for some people to hear, um, and they may be personally difficult to hear. I'll put up some resources at the end as well, some support resources, um, if it's a difficult thing or if someone needs uh, help, that there'll be some resources at the end of the presentations as well. You can actually just uh, cut and paste those, take those. Um, and if you need any help or if you have a family member who may need help, if this is a real issue for anybody on the call today, I just want to make sure that people are safe, uh, look after yourselves and, uh, you know, find, find there are resources there, um, you know, there's women's aid, I've, I'm going to put up those at the end. So the running order today is going to be uh, Professor Louise Crowley, um, we have a Councillor Malachi O'Hara from the Green Party in Northern Ireland. Um, Dr. Robert Bolton from UCC and uh, Colette, Dr. Colette Fenn, uh, Green Party Councillor in Cork City. Um, and I know, I, know, I know Colette through uh, Dr. Margaret O'Keefe many, many years ago. And I went to some of those 50 50 um, meetings, Colette, and there were a huge education, a huge enlightenment, and a huge part of my political awareness as well. So just to, just to remark that. Um, so we'll start with. Um, Professor Louise Crowley from UCC. So Louise, could you just tell us a little bit, um, I'm, I'm saying about 10 minutes per presentation, but let's not be overly pedantic about it. And hopefully at the end, there'll be a little room for, for people to ask some questions as well, be it a question and answer or, or the chat as well, okay? So Louise, uh, if you could get the ball rolling first there on the, on the bystander program and tell us a bit about that, thanks. Sure, John, thanks very much. And I'll watch the clock here. You've heard me before and I'm, <laughs> Brevity is not my strength, but I'll do my best. So um, I suppose uh, before I start, just to give a bit of context. Um, uh, so I'm a family law academic in the School of Law in UCC. And uh, one of my main areas of research is um, domestic and gender based violence. And it is from that that the bystander intervention program um, began and um, developed. But I just wanted to say in, in relation to uh, gender based violence, uh, whether it's domestic abuse, as we would traditionally know, but now recognizing the breadth of abuse and the breadth of circumstances within which it can occur. So whether it's in the, the marital setting, which was traditionally the only relationship where the state was willing to make an intervention and support victim survivors of domestic abuse to our current much more uh, um, broad and accepting uh, regulatory framework, which recognizes that abuse will occur in all forms of intimate relationships. And there is no need to require um, cohabitation or indeed marriage for the state to have the view that it has an obligation to intervene. So just to welcome and recognize that whilst it has its shortcomings, the Domestic Violence Act of 2018, which was very much spurred on by our obligations under the Istanbul Convention, has very much modernized our domestic violence and intimate partner abuse laws and, and uh, introduced the criminalization of coercive control, which in itself recognizes that uh, intimate partner abuse is so much more than physical abuse and can manifest in so many different ways emotional, psychological, financial um, abuse, and that is hugely important. So just to recognize that when we, when we are all talking about sexual harassment, sexual violence, and domestic abuse, that it is the breadth of abuse needs to be acknowledged, 
And that's hugely important to validate the experience of survivors and people who are still um, in the throes of a toxic or violent relationship, however long or whatever the nature of that relationship. So implementation of the legislation is challenging. Education is key. Our first responders need to be supported and educated to be able to recognize the danger that exists if they have a call out and to know how to respond to keep that person safe. Our judiciary need to be better educated. We need specialized judges who hear family law cases every day who can understand and recognize the evidence that's being presented. So whilst I'm going to talk to you about education that we have developed within the third level sector, but which is expanding beyond that um, at the moment, education is fundamental to um, the progression of laws, supports and services for all uh, victim survivors of any form of sexual harassment, violence, domestic or intimate partner abuse. And so that is something that I would be calling on today for people to acknowledge and any work that any party can do on supporting uh, better supports, better legal systems, better court systems and education for anyone involved with um, victim survivors of, of any form of abuse. It's really crucial. So I suppose that's the academic background of the kind of work that I'm doing on an ongoing basis, but from a more, I suppose, practical perspective and other aspect of my work in this area has been the development of a program which is called the Bystander Intervention Program at UCC. Um, and so I have a presentation which I will share if this will. My technology doesn't let me down. Hopefully I can see. Are you seeing that? Yeah. Okay, so let me see. Are you on the first? So I'm wondering, are you on the first slide with the two up the ladder with the poster? Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, great. Okay, so far so good. So yeah, so in essence, the first slide says it all. It's a sexual violence prevention program. It's a very proactive program which seeks to educate and empower participants to recognize unacceptable behavior. And once it's recognized, to have that sense of personal responsibility for the well-being of others as a bystander, and then to have the skills to make a safe and effective intervention. So the central, four central aims of this program, which is available to all staff and students in UCC, and has now been made available to HEIs across the country, as well as a pilot that I'm working with 12 uh, second level schools, mostly in Cork, but also in Kilkenny and Galway, um, and one in Dublin, whereby we are developing a pilot to deliver to TY students as well, modified to make it age appropriate. Uh, the four central aims are to introduce any participant to the concept of being an active bystander. So recognizing that even though you may not be involved in a situation, that as a bystander, you have the capacity to make a difference. And I mean, this might be hard to swallow, but I'm strongly of the view that if you see something and you choose to see something troublesome and you choose to ignore it, you are part of the problem. So really what I'm calling for people to recognize is that whilst uh, this issue is very predominantly a gender-based issue, although I absolutely recognize that men can also be victims of uh, all forms of sexual harassment and violence and intimate partner abuse, women are, the statistics tell us women are predominantly the victims. And so this is not just a women's issue, this is a shared issue. So long as you live in a community with other people, you are part of the solution to this problem. So we want everybody to recognize their capacity to be an active and effective bystander. Within the context of UCC and on the basis of this program, seeing as we're a third level institution and we're uniquely positioned to use our skills as educators and also to reach such a huge art audience, we have over 22,000 students in UCC and two and a half thousand staff. So we want staff and students to understand some key issues. And this is really fundamental education here understand consent, why consent is needed, how to give consent, how to receive consent, and how to understand that it has to be ongoing and mutual. Uh, to understand the boundaries surrounding um, acceptable behavior, so what constitutes sexual assault, aggravated sexual assault, rape, what an abusive and toxic relationship looks like, what kind of behaviors are evidence of that. And then to empower people to do something about situations that they may uh, witness and to empower them and skill them to make the difference, to make the intervention, and ultimately to develop an institutional culture that has changed, that calls for change and affects change. So in the, in the terms of the learning, um, those participants will understand and will learn that there are four stages for intervention. And this is really important to understand how you could bring about change. So something happens and we notice it, but it, we have to notice that it's troublesome and interpret it as a problem if we're ever going to make an intervention, because why would you make an intervention if you think that's just regular behavior? So key there in part two of the four stages is recognizing what's not acceptable. And this is really important, particularly amongst young people at third level. The horrific normalization of sexual harassment, hostility, the daily grind of comments, jokes, groping, all of that behavior that, that you know, young people will admit to say, well, that's just part of college life. I go out on a Saturday night, I'm in a nightclub and someone grabs me or grubs me. It's just the way it is. 
but it's not the way it has to be. And this is really important. We open the students' eyes to the fact that this is not acceptable and that if they feel uncomfortable, other people will feel uncomfortable. And it's in recognizing that it's not acceptable. It is then where we want to trigger a sense of responsibility for doing something about it. So as a witness to the unacceptable behavior, you feel responsible and then you possess the necessary skills to act. So I won't go through this, but we, we work the participants through the reasons why they might be fearful or slow to intervene. And then we talk to them about the importance of speaking up together, the solidarity in speaking up and having people step in behind you in support. And that's the value of group learning with bystander intervention. It's not really good if only one of us ever takes the training because you're reliant upon those around you to support your interventions so that the, 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 the silenced voice to date becomes louder. And we know that the majority of people engage in respectful relationships and want to uh, be respected. But the problem is that so long as the silence is perpetuated, the, the minority who are perpetrating this unacceptable behavior, they believe there's a false consensus surrounding what they're doing because there isn't an objection. And so we want to raise these voices. We want our students to speak up together, to be given the language. And we do role plays as part of our final workshop to give them the opportunity in a safe space where they can express those objections. And they do come back to me afterwards in focus groups and say, just like we did in the workshop, Louise, I was able to speak out last Saturday night. And then when I spoke out, just as we said, other people stepped in and supported my objection. So it's really powerful and the students feel very empowered, but really the sense of feeling responsibility, changing the culture within which they live, sharing the sense that they can make a difference and they can make a difference for somebody else. They can be the voice to speak up and affect change recognizing that they and all of their peers deserve that safe third level experience, ultimately working towards a zero tolerance approach to all forms of abuse. So in terms of the feedback from students, a couple of things I'd say is that I had a workshop yesterday and these students were students in analytical chemistry, master's students. And we had uh, worked with uh, Dr. Eric Moore in UCC and he put this on as part of their curriculum in one of their modules. So they had to do it. And I asked them, you know, if you hadn't been told you had to do it, do you think you might have done it? And most of them said, well, they hadn't heard of it. So that's a really, that's a problem that I'm working on all the time in terms of visibility. But when I said to them, now that you've done it, and I said, I'm not taking any notes, I'm not gonna write down anyone's name, you know, would you prefer not to have done it? And, and to a man and a woman and a person, they said, actually, we're really glad we were given the opportunity. So what I've learned over the years is that, even though we offer this on a voluntary basis, in the circumstances where it's given compulsory, the feedback is always, thank you for giving me this opportunity. So I think it's really important to recognize that there's a huge appetite for education and learning. There's a huge appetite for being able to make a difference. And I think it's really important that we bring those opportunities to people and allow them to exercise their voice in a, in a way that they know that is safe, but also effective. So finally, just to give you an indication of the impact of the learning. So we take um, we give a questionnaire to students and all participants, um, I should say staff are doing this too, and before they start the training, uh, which is four modules online, self-directed for two hours, and then a final in-person uh, in workshop for an hour, which I or one of my colleagues will facilitate, where we discuss the learning and do some role playing. Pre the workshop, we asked them uh, if they thought there was little they could do about sexual harassment. Now, in fairness, um, they did think they could make a difference, but were not sure about the extent to which they could. But after the workshop, you'll see that 82% of participants felt yes, they could make a difference. And 17 said they could, albeit limited. Less than 1% felt that they couldn't. Understanding what constitutes sexual harassment and violence, 69% felt they knew before the workshop, but a whopping 96% post the workshop felt they now could recognize sexual harassment and violence. Less than one felt they couldn't. And again, in terms of ability to intervene, before the workshop, 27% felt, yeah, I have a good ability. 50, limited, 23, did not know what to do. And after the workshop, 80% said, yes, they agreed they had a good ability. And 20 um, said they had a limited ability, but no one said they couldn't now intervene. And really, this is what our role in, is as educators, to give them the knowledge and the education and then the skills to do something about it in a safe and effective way. So the experience from students, and I just have two slides here with quotes, you know, um, where they make interventions. So they give us feedback about things they've done. So the first one here very quickly is a student, not about sexual violence, but was in a class online. Someone said something inappropriate and rude and he had the courage to message in and say, I don't think that's okay. You need to be more considerate. Was very nervous, but he said, I didn't know how they'd react, but just like I said in the workshop, once I'd said something, others who felt weird about it also spoke up. Thank you for making me aware of how to speak up 
when things aren't okay. This other slide, she made an intervention. She saw a woman she didn't know being harassed by a man who was visibly uncomfortable, went over and said, hi, how are you? Uh, and they, she removed that girl from the scene and afterwards the girl thanked her knowing what she had done. Again, another person said, I took action when I saw two girls being harassed. I felt much more confident. I knew exactly how to act. And someone else said, yeah, I've made six interventions that I, I wouldn't have made before. So this program seeks to educate, as I say, and upskill and to give people the capacity to speak up, to make the difference, to recognize what's not unacceptable and to, and to demand a zero tolerance. And the hope is that if we have enough voices for change, that that voice becomes the majority and we can affect the change that we need across not just campus, but across the community more broadly. So just that final slide is a recognition of the, the, the toolkit source upon which we developed our project, which is um, from the UK, Dr. Rachel Fenton and her colleagues. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks, thanks, Louise. Could, could I indulge myself by asking one question? Um, Please do. It's, it's obviously the, the program is designed uh, for application at third third level. Is there mm. is there learning? Um, and I know there are plans to kind of roll it out in other in other um, environments. Um, but is there is there learning for for political parties, businesses uh, in from bystander program? Is there? Yeah. So yeah. So I am working with various organisations, both. Uh, private business, but also other state agencies in terms of developing workplace programs, uh, very much to, so that for a safer work environment. So the very first thing is, of course, bringing this into the workplace, but then engaging with people across. So whether it's the workplace, whether it's a community endeavor, whether it's a youth group, like I've worked with you, John, in the past, whether it's a school environment, you know, it's about starting the conversations. And even at second level, the feedback I've gotten back was, well, firstly, this is the first time anybody has taught us anything, you know, in the language that we understand, referencing experiences that we have, you know, modified um, uh, scenarios for second level. Equally, I would do the very same for businesses or any other group. So I think that um, this type of education, not just my program, other programs, Active Consent in Galway is a really successful initiative for focusing specifically on the issue of consent. And, um, you know, respectfully, these programs need funding and support. Um, they can be rolled out, they can be modified, they can be, you know, there's no point reinventing the wheel. The message is successful, the message is clear, um, and what it does is it brings people together and gives everyone a voice. So it's really important because it's very hard to deliver training to perpetrators of offences, and it's very challenging to deliver training to people who are survivors. But the, the value of the joy of bystander is that every single person is a bystander irrespective of whatever you've been through or whatever you have done yourself as a perpetrator. So when delivering the message, I know that in every class there is most likely one or two survivors and certainly probably a perpetrator in the room, but they're hearing it as a bystander. And we know from like work in psychology that everybody wants to find the hero in themselves. So I know that they're actually hearing it, even the perpetrators, whereas I think if I was going in saying, you know, this is how you can't behave, you, I'm talking to you, you can't behave like this. There's a huge resistance and a defensiveness so I think that it's coming out it from the community and the bystander approach means that the education is being received, but in a sort of a neutral way and in an empowering way. So yes, I suppose in a roundabout way to answer your question, John, it absolutely is suited to any environment. So long as you have people interacting and we have the capacity for any form of unacceptable behavior, obviously mine is grounded in sexual harassment and violence, but you're talking about bullying, you're talking about antisocial behavior, you're talking about mistreatment of the elderly, you're talking about all kinds of behavior. And where you see something as a bystander, it's knowing that you can do it and you can do it safely, um, but you also need to be able to recognize what's not acceptable. Okay. So there's so much learning in it and it is very transferable. That's brilliant, thanks, thanks Louise. Thanks, um, and uh, yeah, we, that, I mean, it, there's so much in that, that that's, this, hopefully this is just the beginning of a conversation, but, uh, but, but thanks, thanks, thanks Louise. Um, I think Ma Malachi, um, Malachi O'Hara from our, uh, from Green Party in Ireland, Ireland Deputy Leader, Councillor Kamaliki McGrath, or O'Hara. Um, I think there's probably some commonality there, I would say, Maliki, in what you're going to say. There is, actually, John. Thanks very much, and Louise, that was fantastic. Thank you. I'm actually attending um, bystander training on Monday with Graham Golden from Scotland. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that, actually. Um, so I, I suppose, like Louise, I maybe set out some context in some of my knowledge and experience around these issues, John. Um, and uh, so when I, when I first returned from England in 2004, my first job was working um, across North and West Belfast in a relationship and sexuality education project. Um, and that was targeted primarily around reducing our levels of teenage pregnancy in Northern Ireland. 
Um, and of course, it was sex ed education programs. So we talked about consent. We talked about access to contraception. Um, we talked about healthy relationships. Um, and I, I think I remember one thing that really struck me at that time, John, um, and maybe a worry, and I think something that we maybe haven't moved to address um, as much, um, or our, our, our sort of training and programs maybe haven't caught up with that, is I remember young people beginning that mass access to the internet. So, you know, I'm a man of a certain age, I'm 42, and that pornography for, for me growing up was something that was a video or a magazine that was furtively passed around the school. Now, there's a whole other debate about pornography, but now that young people have mass access to the internet, there is a, a warped understanding of that access to pornography and what that means in terms of relationships and sex and sexual behavior. Um, and I think it'd be interesting to look at that in a more in-depth um, uh, sort of academic research around maybe how that's changed some attitudes. So I worked there for three years and that was, that was working in areas of deprivation across North and West Belfast. And then after that, I joined an, an LGBT charity, which is called the Rainbow Project. So the focus shifted from specifically around young people and, and healthy relationships to then um, queer people and LGBT needs around these issues. Um, and I think there are some specific issues in terms of queer communities. Um, I, I think we talk around, there's a difficult detente between the sexual liberationist movement that has always been part of queer community about we can have relationships and how we structure our relationships around monogamy, around partners, around the type of sex that we may or may not want to have, but also about how we're educated around what is appropriate sexual boundaries. And there's a real feeling in relationship and sexuality education in the North. Now, um, I know a lot of you are maybe Greens and uh, or maybe supporters of other parties, but we've had a real challenge in Northern Ireland in terms of relationship and sex ed and the success of education ministers, whether they're DUP or Sinn Féin, have always advocated that schools will teach according to their ethos and have not moved from that principle. And um, we now currently have a DUP minister who's very fixed on that, but who knows, hopefully after the next assembly next year, we'll see a much more progressive minister who will actually say to schools, this is the minimum standard of content. It must be inclusive. It must be age appropriate. Um, and, and it must provide young people with the tools that they need in order to have healthy relationships in 2021 or 2022. Um, so the difficulty with that is that if schools teach according to their ethos, I'm of a Catholic background. I'm an atheist, but I'm of a Catholic background. And Catholic doctrine says that homosexuality is intrinsically disordered. Is that an appropriate RSE teaching to be giving to young people in our schools? I don't think so, but successive education ministers have supported that um, and reinforced that. I think the other additional difficulty we have in the North is that um, in terms of teaching RSE, we have a particular organization who is queer negative, anti-contraception, and believes that sex is something that be, should be saved for marriage and procreation. Um, and they um, voluntarily go into over 70% of our post-primary schools in Northern Ireland. So that's another real challenge in terms of how we address the messages that young people are getting around sex and relationships. Um, so <clears throat> I, I also, you know, I think very much for us, if, if, you know, Greens who believe in a just transition or, or, or wider political members or non-party political members who believe in a just transition, I think very much the base root of this problem is that homo, for me, homophobia and transphobia are things that are rooted in sexism and patriarchal structures. Um, and I think that's, that's important that we, you know, as any sort of training or any sort of awareness around these issues, that we reflect in some element on those patriarchal structures that are deeply embedded in our society. Um, every woman that I know, I'm a gay man and I'm very lucky to have many, many great female friends, but every woman I know can tell you stories about sexual harassment, um, you know, from the, that low level wolf whistling and, and um, you know, unwanted or unconsented contact right through to much, much more horrific structures or, or horrific examples. I other, the other thing that I would talk about in terms of the North is our particular context with the conflict. So, you know, lots of that is rooted in machismo, um, you know, and maybe while other parts of these jurisdictions were having conversations um, 
around and mainstream conversations around um, sexual violence, around relationship and sex ed, around gender inequality, that was muted or not allowed into the mainstream discourse because we were so focused on the troubles and the conflict. Um, you know, there's something about men and their guns, and there's a very glib kind of um, meme, internet meme, that, you know, people are much more comfortable seeing men with guns than they are seeing two men kissing. And I think that that maybe strikes to the nature of some of these. Um, there's also the gendered element around violence. Um, and I would also say that, you know, on the coal face of peace building, that work was often done by women, um, thanklessly, without funding, um, and having those difficult, challenging conversations that brought us to some form of peace. Now, people who are familiar with, with the conflict in the North and our political process rather than our peace process um, will be aware that a group of women came together in 1996 to set up the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition. And that was in response to the fact that it looked like our peace talks um, and the agreement that may have come out of it would be signed exclusively by men that women were just not at the table. So there was no um, particular reference to the needs of women emerging from conflict. And thankfully the Women's Coalition were able to secure um, enough votes to be part of the talks and then to have assembly representation for the first five years of the assembly. Um, it might be no coincidence that our two current seats in the assembly in North Down and South Belfast are the historic seats of the Women's Coalition. Um, so I think there's a, a proud tradition that we carry on, and I'm proud that our party in the North is, you know, led by a renowned feminist in Claire Bailey, with her deputy as a renowned queer activist myself, leading an environmental and social justice party. Um, so where are we in Northern Ireland? Um, the, the, the fragmented nature of power here um, and the disjointed nature of um, normal politics in that we have had 23 years of an assembly, um, but we haven't had the progress on a lot of these issues that we would have hoped for. Um, a couple of years ago, people will remember the high profile rugby rape trial. Um, and consequent to that, we had the Gillen review and Sir John Gillen identified four kind of thematic beliefs in his report um, and a series of recommendations. And the first was that was under reporting and the high attrition rate was unacceptable in society. And it put a, a kind of question mark on the rule of the claim of uh, the, the claim of the rule of law. Secondly, the pathway from initial complaint to trial is far too steep, too long, too unwieldy, and both complainant or both the complainant and the accused and needed urgent reform. The third was that the current trial process is too daunting and uncompromising for complainants and needs radical revision. And the fourth was that many of the problems in the present law and procedures adversely affect both complainants and the accused spring from that culture from which we all currently live and particularly around patriarchy and machismo. Um, just this week, you know, two and a bit years after the Gillen review, we've had some horrific um, data around um, the fall in um, rape prosecutions. Um, in fact, we had 20 in 2020 prosecutions in 2020, 2019, 2020, to just eight prosecutions for rape in 2020, 2021. And that's horrific and untenable. And part of that is that we haven't um, delivered all of the Gillen recommendations as we expected to. So I think we're slightly further behind other parts of these jurisdictions in dealing with these issues. And that's in part because of the legacy of the conflict, but also because of our dysfunctional nature of politics in the North. Um, so thanks very much for inviting me to participate in this. And I hope in that that was some use in, in shining a light on our particular complexities here. Yeah, that was that was great, Malachi. Very powerful, and I think the fact that it, yet again, women women's role in the peace process has been, both was has been and continues to be photoshopped, isn't it? Every time every time there's a journalistic comment, it's usually it's usually a man that's asked, but where, where 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 there was actually huge huge on the ground probably participation by by women in the peace process, you know. So and very interesting that you you were talking about homophobia and transphobia sort of coming from this, the same place, this kind of uh, rooted in, I think you said, rooted in patriarchal structures or patriarchal beliefs. Um, am I representing what you said fairly there? Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's very interesting. 
Um, okay, thanks, thanks, Malika, and lo and lovely to meet you. By the way, um, first time meeting, but I'm sure I'm sure we'll meet many more times, hopefully. Um, so our our next speaker, and um, I think it kind of implicit or maybe explicit in that as well, was this concept of masculinities. Uh, I think it'd be fair to say, and I know um, our next uh, panelist is. Dr. Robert uh, Bolton from UCC. I know I know Robert quite quite well too, um, and Robert is doing some very interesting uh, research in in many things. But among them is actually a, a, the Positive Masculinities Project, and I think you're you're going to talk to that a little, um, Robert Forrest, are you? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So good good to see you. Welcome welcome aboard, and um, I'll 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 give you the floor. Great, thanks a million, John, and uh, I really appreciate you inviting me to the panel as well. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. So I'm going to go straight into it. So I'm uh, Robert, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute for Social Science in UCC. So uh, before I introduce the study that I'm involved with in UCC, I just want to draw your attention to what I believe is the importance of, importance of language. So that when it comes to every social issue, but especially um, gender violence, language is really important. So even for example, today, a question which could be asked is, are, are we talking about gender-based violence? Are we talking about violence against women? Or are we talking about men's violence against women? And those phrases provoke different images and feelings uh, amongst different people. Um, and there are always uh, ideological assumptions in how we talk about social issues. So with the term, um, preventing violence against women, for example, uh, our minds could start to think of uh, the issue in terms of a negative frame of reference. So we may begin about, uh, we may begin to think about don'ts or should not. And uh, when it comes to prevention, um, sometimes prevention is used in the context of victim blaming, where women are given advice about how to prevent their own uh, victimization. So a similar uh, um, question then, uh, could be around how can we prevent men from committing acts of violence against women. So here, um, it's kind of a negative frame of reference. Uh, it involves thinking about the causes of socio-negative uh, behaviour. And the implication is that to address this behaviour, we need to think about removing the things which cause socio-negative behaviour. So in UCC then, I'm part of a, a, a three-year project called Positive Mass which I guess is short for positive masculinity. And so this uh, represents an alternative framing of the project of uh, the problem of violence against women. So one of the aims of the project is to explore how young men aged 18 to 24, in particularly, uh, could be supported in, uh, towards addressing violence against women. And it's about how can we promote alternative forms of masculinity that do not resort to uh, violence. So I guess in terms of that question of frame of reference, it's about how can we put in place or how can we promote socio-positive uh, behaviour? So as part of this project, uh, we interviewed 27 young people aged 18 to 24, and we asked them questions about how violence against women can be addressed. And, uh, young, and we asked them about their perceptions of the role that young men could play in being part of the solution to violence against women. So what I want to do in the, just the next two slides is just deliver some very quick points about some of the things which have cropped up for us around the role of men in engaging in violence against women prevention. So some background points first is that uh, young men's role as being part of the solution to violence against women is sometimes not thought about or even considered. So Sorka here, um, uh, she responded to the interview question through email. She didn't want to be interviewed, and at the very end of her uh, at the very end of her document, she wrote a little side note and that she said she never really considered the ways that uh, we could encourage young men to speak out about the topic. And another young woman as well talked about. Uh, she kind of delivered an aside during the interview. She kind of paused me and she said, "You know what? I never thought about the idea that there are young men out there who do have." gender equitable attitudes, who do have positive attitudes, who recognize violence against women as a problem, but they don't, they don't really know how to actualize their beliefs or their desire to be part of the solution to that. Um, so men do intervene. 
Um, Brian here uh, talked a bit about one of the trends who educated him a lot around um, the origins of certain words that were used uh, against women, you know, sexist words, misogynistic words. So that was an example of peer education, which he talked about there. Uh, one thing which cropped up for us is that young men uh, recognize the problem of men's violence against women and are concerned about it. Odara here says that we, as in men, I feel like we've called women everything except women. There'll be a name of a woman except uh, women. So what he's talking about here, I guess, is the historical and continued denial of women's full and complete personhood. Um, so some of the some of the young people and the young men came forward to participate in the interviews because, like Dara, they they had close women in their lives who had been uh, sexually assaulted, and so Dara in particularly was uh, quite troubled about that, and so he was happy to see this sort of study being done. So um, young men also recognised the impact of their silence on violence against women. So this is uh, Dara again, he's talking about a group chat, he's talking about some things which some of his friends were saying, and he, he didn't uh, speak up about it himself, but in the interview he thinks about, um, you know, nobody said don't say that, and he says, so our silence will, uh, kind of says to him that this language is okay. So now we're kind of coming onto the topic about uh, what promotes men's engagement in being part of the solution to violence against women. So again, this is Dara speaking, and he says, personally, I would love to do something about it. For example, me and a room full of like 20 women. And if we had to go on a march, I would love to do it, but it would be hard. But if I knew there's, there would be another four boys with me, it would be easy. So then this is, brings us on to the question of, uh, you know, the barriers that men face in actualizing their beliefs and their desire for action um, and in actualizing the recognition of violence against women as a problem. So Dara again here talks about if he was a part of a protest um, he, and if he was the only man there, he would feel like a wuss. This is, isn't what men do, you know, we don't speak about this, it's not our problem. So in terms of the question of what promotes a uh, socio-positive behavior or values or what promotes more alternative or positive forms of uh, masculinity, one thing which cropped up a lot is that men listen to other men. So Brian Owen here says sexual abuse ruins somebody's life and I think men will listen more to men. I think a, a woman turning around to a man and talking about this kind of stuff, I think a lot of them would kind of laugh it off. But if it's a men, if it's a man saying it, or if it's a man speaking out to other, another man, men are more likely to take it seriously. Now that's also a problem in itself. Like we, the ideal should be that uh, men would take women seriously, uh, equally as other men. Um, uh, but uh, young men also recognised in our study um, the socially constructed basis of violence against women. So this is Sean here, he's talking about friends who have, his friends who have catcalled uh, women. And he recognizes that part of the reason for that is that they're expecting me to start going, yes, you're class, you're brilliant or whatever. Um, so I guess one of the problems in terms of um, social change, especially when it comes to gender issues, is that the, the belief that gender or gendered behaviors are fixed in biology is one of the key things which, um, uh, prohibits uh, change if you but if you believe that gender and gender behaviors are socially constructed then as Louise said in her own talk it doesn't have to be the way things are so uh, not only young women uh, but we found in our interviews that young men were quite resourceful in their ideas about how to address uh, violence against women so Brian here is talking about bystander intervention and he's talking about how he wouldn't necessarily go about openly calling out someone in a room of like 100 people and making them feel like they're now alienated or targets. He says, uh, and the big thing I think about changing people's behaviors in a positive manner is that idea of unconditional positive regard. So just reflecting on Brian's statement there, it's almost as if uh, engaging and challenging men is not about calling out, but about calling in. So about engaging men in the conversation 
um, engaging your friends in the conversation, asking them, why are you doing this? Why do you think that? Why did you say that? Um, and it's not about a confrontation, but about a care confrontation. So these are things which crop up in the literature as well, because sometimes when it comes to bystander intervention, uh, young men feel that the only way they can intervene is through confrontation and being aggressive. And I think some of that as well is possibly due, due to wanting to be the, the bigger man, I guess, of the, the situation. So um, young people also talked about the need to utilize men's strengths and again, this comes up in the, the research literature as well. Um, so again, just about being able to play on the positive. Um, you know, Carrie here talks about uh, protective values that men may have. Now as well, this sort of um, idea of protection, it can be a bit problematic as well. You know, the idea that men always need to protect women. Um, that's another debate that's out there in the, the literature. But um, engaging positively with men and using men's strengths and utilizing their strengths is something that young people said could be an idea forward. So young men need the support of uh, other men. So we know from bystander intervention studies that the, the presence of socially supportive uh, male peers uh, increases the likelihood of men intervening. So men's confidence that another man will back them up in a, in a situation where they're intervening is a significant factor in men's sexual assault uh, prevention. So sometimes, especially when it comes to uh, lad culture, which is a term used in the UK and Irish context, and there's something which cropped up for us, there's, also, there's sometimes, I feel, this simplistic idea that we should tell young men, you know, don't be like your friends, don't follow the group, don't be like the lads. Um, but again, that's a negative frame of reference. If you could turn that around, um, there are good reasons for thinking about male pair groups or even lads not as an obstacle for combating violence against women but a resource towards uh, addressing violence against women so working with and not working against uh, male friendship groups could be a useful way to address violence against women because as carrie also mentioned in the interview uh, for many men these strong friendship groups are a key source of belonging for them and they don't want to feel alienated from their own friendship groups, which also may provide them a sense of support. And finally, then, um, one of the most important themes which cropped up for us, I'm sure Louise will be happy to hear, is uh, young people want to be provided with opportunities to develop bystander intervention skills. It was quite interesting to see interviewing young people in our study that some of them actually gave very specific uh, phrases or ideas as to how to address um, problematic uh, situations. But you know, both young men and women in the study talked about the difficulty that young men in particular face in standing up to another man um, and not knowing what to do. So um, that's, this was one of the most uh, common themes. So it's uh, so everything what I've talked about and everything which we are finding is absolutely supporting what Louise has been doing in bystander intervention. And it's great to see these uh, initiatives now being rolled out uh, more widely. So uh, that's me. Um, thanks very much. Thanks, thanks Robert. Um, and again, um, very, uh, very interesting and enlightening and very complimentary to uh, all the, the two previous speakers as well, because um, sometimes it, it can be a challenge uh, to be I mean you know over the years I would have participated in I don't know if people are familiar with the white ribbon campaign um, I'm sure Louise and Colette would be uh, familiar with that it's about men men being um, I suppose champions um, or standing up or, or, or a, a kind of what you were saying there Robert about challenging other men on their attitudes their language their behaviors um, but that isn't always easy so it's about providing and I suppose what 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 the bystander program and what you're referring to there is, is actually you might have the intention of doing something, but you may not have the tools to do it. And I think those tools are very important. Um, but uh, listen, that's very interesting. And I think you've, you've published, there is, some, there is some interesting stuff that you've already published that's in, that's in the public realm, I think, uh, Robert, is it? Yeah, um, actually, thanks, John, for pointing that out because it's actually free to anyone. It's open access at the moment, so it's in the Irish Journal of Sociology, 
and part of it, it's mainly about uh, sexual assault and harassment and the problem with that in nightclubs and uh, young people's perceptions as to why men do it and the, the importance of intervention and their perceptions as to why men don't intervene as well. So it actually comes, it, it ties in very nicely with the whole bystander issue as well. So if you just check that out in the Irish Journal of Sociology, um, it's open yeah. access. So free to read. If it was possible, Robert, could I prevail upon you to put it put it yeah. in, in the yeah. chat? If that would be possible. I'm sure people would. I'll like do to, that there. Yeah. Um, grab that. Perfect. Um, thanks, thanks for that, uh, Robert. That's very, very enlightening. Um, and uh, finally, um, uh, Councillor uh, Doctor Doctor Gletfrin, um I've, I've often I've often been at academic um, presentations where where. Uh, the, the women are introduced as Mary or Neve, and the, the the male academics are introduced as professor or doctor. So, um, if if I if I'm pedantic in the use of it, there's a there's a reason, because uh, I think it's it's um, doctors are not easily earned, <laughs> and I think you know. Um, but anyway, I know. So, uh, Colette, whom I've known for quite some time, um, through the, I, I referred earlier on to um, my colleague friend and I think mentor, probably Dr. Margaret O'Keefe, I think is actually on, on, on with us at the moment, um, a mutual friend um, and a huge uh, inspiration for, for, for many. Um, so Colette, you're going to talk a little bit about your, 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 your journey, as you put it. Um, I think you said, what did you say to me last night? I think you put something in writing, your journey as a feminist in a man's world. That's right, John. Uh, yeah, thanks, Ilson. Um, I know John from the time, um, we would have press ganged him into going to one of our 50-50 meetings when we were trying to whip up an audience for, um, for candidate gender quotas, which was at the time going up like a lead balloon. So thank you, John. He, he did actually come along to one of our meetings. Um, Very happy to be there, Colette. <laughs> so yeah, I suppose, um, like Maliki, I grew up uh, on the other part of the island in the south. Um, and uh, I suppose 1983 was a pivotal year for me uh, from the perspective of becoming a feminist in that that was the year that we inserted into our constitution, uh, the Eighth Amendment. Um, and that really uh, catalyzed uh, my thinking around, you know, am I an equal citizen or not? Uh, and certainly the Eighth Amendment, as far as I was concerned, um, made me less less of a human being um, to my sort of born male colleagues. So I suppose that was that was a pivotal year for me. And um, I left Ireland three years later and I went to Southern Africa. And I encountered uh, the apartheid regime in uh, in South Africa. And I suppose I went from a society where I was considered a lesser human being as a woman to being actually in the in-group where I was considered a better human being because I was white. Um, and so I kind of flipped from, from being, uh, you know, discriminated against to being part of a group that ended up uh, discriminating against other people. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's kind of interesting when you look at it from that perspective that you end up being in a group that actually you've never really uh, call, called a meeting and decided, yeah, this is, this is what we want to agree on as this group and you're identified as this particular group. So I think we have to recognize that we're all born into a sexist system um, and we had two uh, very nice young men uh, who did a transition year project uh, in the uh, Irish Young Scientists uh, a couple of years back, where look, which looks at the, the sexual stereotyping that happens in five to seven year olds. And so from very early on, we're conditioned to behave in particular ways as men and women. And you know, they're, they're, uh, as Maliki points out, um, you know, the norm is to be straight, the norm is to be, you know, a high achiever. So you're constantly being pushed to do certain norms. Women should be caring, men should be strong, all that sort of thing. And you're also, uh, I suppose, uh, being educated in what I call, and lots of people actually, the myth of the meritocracy that 
um, you know, you, you will win out because you're better, because you're, you know, you work hard, because you get up early in the morning and all that sort of thing. And so I think part of the problem has been the sort of economic system that we've been, has been in the ascendancy, the sort of um, neoliberal economics that we have. And because of that particular lens on, on how we want to organize society, it, it very much divides us into, women, women, into winners and losers, which in my book is completely not how we live as social animals. Uh, I mean, if you organize a kid's party, you will ensure that everyone gets a, a fair share of the spoils, that everyone's able to participate uh, and everyone goes home happy with, you know, with their goodie bag. And, you know, why is it that when, when, when we become adults that suddenly that's not, that's not the norm? Um, and I suppose studies show that well-managed diverse groups outperform homogeneous ones. And they're more committed, have higher collective intelligence, and are better at making decisions and solving problems. So why do we promote a particular type of guy or a particular type of woman? And I, and I suppose that's part of my learning as a feminist, to try and support more diverse thinking um, and to you know, celebrate what is good about being a guy and what's good about being, being female. Um, and I see violence as a spectrum. Um, I see it, and, and Louise will have talked about this, about, you know, coercive control and, and um, you know, down to sort of physical violence, that, that it is a spectrum. But within a sexist system that sees one sex as, you know, more important than another, um, disaggregated uh, data makes makes women invisible. So if you take, for instance, the topic of public toilets, uh, equality would suggest that we should have equal numbers of public toilets. But actually, it takes women two and a half times longer to do to do the, the, the business. Uh, and that's not to mention the fact that they have to perhaps dispose of period, period products or whatever. So this kind of um, Trying, trying to shoehorn everybody into a particular frame um, impacts across a whole spectrum uh, of, of things. And it's something that in a sexist system, we have to be constantly trying to disrupt that, trying to, to ask the question why, uh, and constantly looking, you know, as now I'm a counsellor, I'm actually able to uh, influence the way we do things. Um, and we have set up a women's caucus and we presented the, the rest of the councillors with a book, which was called Good Guys. And that's about highlighting to men um, that most men don't, aren't violent to their partners. And they don't condone uh, the sorts of things that we read in the paper. Yet, because it's never really uh, talked about and in the same way as Malachi talked about the extent to which women in a very polarized society as in the North are told to be quiet, if you don't actually shine a lens on, on those, those issues, then you know, people are impacted negatively, uh, very much so. And so in a, in a place like Sweden, where they're very into you know, having an equal society, they looked at clear, how they cleared the snow and they wanted to make sure that they weren't um, being, you know, favoring one sex over the other. And what they found was that they do the, they clear the roads first because, you know, people are, are driving to work, but mostly that that's of assistance to, to men. Whereas the footpaths uh, are, where, where usually where the women are and they're usually there with the children and so they actually flipped it that they started to clear the footpaths first uh, and then then they'd look after the roads and what they found was that it actually saved money uh, because there was a decrease in uh, fractures and falls and so people uh, ended up um, not basically falling down and ending up in hospital. So how we organize our economy um, 
it is very much uh, geared towards the lens that you use to, to view the world. And this is where I ended up uh, along with people like Margaret and Fiona, Fiona Buck, Dr. Fiona Buckley in UCC and others. Uh, we set up 50-50 because we, we said, look, if women are not in the room, then what matters to women is not uh, going to be considered. And equally, GDP, which um, basically uh, measures the amount of activity there is in the economy, but it doesn't actually uh, make a moral judgment about what good, what's good or what's not good. So, for instance, uh, a crime spree would impact GDP in a positive way, in the sense that you know you have to fix whatever was was broken. Um, but the sort of community work and volunteering that doesn't get counted. Uh, and so the way we actually look at what is going on in our economy is very much uh, impacted by whether we're viewing the world through uh, a male lens or a female lens. And there's lots of men that don't particularly like uh, GDP and growth as a way, particularly on, on, a, on a green call. Uh, we would be much more interested in metrics around well-being. And so with this silencing of women and with this um, sort of minimizing of uh, a, a female perspective, that has real impacts on, on everybody. Um, and you will see that um, there was, uh, during the Brexit debates, women's credentials get called into question much more. And we had the example of Molly Scott Cato, who is a professor of economics, had, had a guy from the Brexit party basically telling her she didn't know what she was talking about when she was saying that, you know, the, the uh, economy in Britain would be negatively impacted. Um, I'm not sure how long I have, because I'm just looking at the time. But I suppose my point is, as, as a feminist um, and having spoken to men who also are, uh, you know, not in agreement with the way we do it, um, it's, it's important to basically understand that actually you do need to have a, div a, div a diverse group of people in the room because everybody is negatively impacted when you don't. So I'm going to I'm going to leave it there, uh, and uh, I'll hand it back to you, John. Thanks, Claire. That's um, that's that's fantastic. Um, I kinda, and we have a few questions here, so I'm just going to come to those very quickly. And I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of time, but um, uh, I, I equally I think it's such an important topic. Um, we'll just in, indulge indulge us for a few more minutes. Uh, and yeah, you were you were referring there, Claire, to to the book Good Guys. So to, can you just very, very briefly tell, tell us tell us about that and how did that come about? I'm just very interested. Yeah, so this, this is a book written by two men in the American army, and they're talking about the extent to which uh, sexism in the army has been an issue. And, you know, essentially pointing out to men how they, how they can um, help when it comes to a, a, a greater level of awareness around sexism. So, you know, women lack confidence because you're born into a system where you're con constantly undermined. So it's even just to, to point that out to people. Um, the macho culture uh, where, you know, the topic of conversation is inevitably football. Um, and that, that, you know, impacts on, on guys who have no interest in football. And there are some women that are interested in football, you know. So it's about, you know, being aware is somebody being excluded because of the topics of conversations that you're choosing? Um, you know, and it, it, it don't, if you end up in a room full of men, ask why, you know, is this <laughs> an area? And I mean, I, I had this with a colleague in the economics department in relation to a sports seminar that he was organizing and it was almost entirely men at this thing. And, and his response was, well, I put the call out and this is the people that turned up. Yeah, too, too, too often, too often the case, isn't it? And we all, I mean, it, and we must acknowledge we all have biases and assumptions and it's our duty all the time to be constantly vigilant and, and, and um, examining ourselves. Um, listen, we, I have two, two questions and a, a, a comment. So um, 
should we shouldn't we won't overrun too long because I know people it's it's a Saturday and people have you know um, given us time to be here and I, I don't want to put out too much. Um, so we have a question from Blahina. I'll just I'll just read it out. Um, can each panelist give one suggestion of a real change they would make tomorrow if they had the power? Uh, why this why this change and what do we need to facilitate such change? So if you kind of one one big ticket answer or one big ticket um, change you could make tomorrow, I'll just run if I'll just run through the panel maybe just um, in 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 order of appearance there. Maybe Louise, you'd like to take that first. Sure, I won't say bystander intervention should be compulsory <laughs> for everybody in the country. What I will say is I think our criminal justice system needs to be uh, victim centered. And I think I would build dedicated family law courts with dedicated judges who would listen to domestic violence cases. There was a 40% increase in the course of the of COVID um, and the applications are every year, I gave a class during the week, every year we're going up 500,000 applications for uh, court orders and the judges are not, well, a lot of judges are not sufficiently trained and it's not fair on them. And it's definitely not fair on the, the people who come before the courts. And also just to say, too many applicants, predominantly women, are having their cases adjourned and they're returning to a home where they are continuing to be abused. And even if the abuser is not in the home, he is stalking, he is watching, he is he's psychologically abusing them. And it is an ongoing, absolute, horrific life that so many women and some men are living and we are not doing enough about it. So we need to invest in our system, our courts, our judges, um, our practitioners, and we need access to immediate access for people to to remedies the remedies are there but if they're not accessible they're no good to anybody thanks louise and malachi um just maybe something briefly yourself if you if you had yeah uh, dismantle the patriarchy john is the overarching um answer but i suppose what's much more practical is um, you know, I, I would legislate in the North for mandatory RFC, and if we want to shift culture and focus and bring a new generation that's much more aware and less tolerant of these issues, then that's what we need to do. And uh, Robert? Hi John, I'm so glad that question was asked because I'm making it my mission to say what I'm about to say in each presentation I give, but I would introduce mandatory age-appropriate sex and relationship education that's inclusive, that encrypts and empowers young people with the skills and knowledge the need to develop an ethical sense of self because we've come so far in our scientific technological progression as a, as a human race, but not far enough in terms of our social relations with each other. So that's what I would do, putting it very simply. Okay, thanks, thanks Robert. And uh, Colette? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the most powerful things during the uh, campaign to repeal the Eighth Amendment was uh, in her shoes. And I think if we can put ourselves in the out groups shoes, like whether it's travelers, whether it's people of color um, someone from a migrant background, you know, how would I survive if, if, if I was that person, you know, and I think that that is really uh, instructive then, then when you have to put yourself in their shoes. Okay, that's great. Thanks, thanks, Colette. Uh, there's a question from uh, from Grace o O'Sullivan. Um, could you please ask the panel what can be done when there's an absolute unawareness by the perpetrator of their behaviour of misogyny, psychological abuse, putting down, coercion, etc. All these behaviours being carried out in, in a subtle, often quote sneaky unquote way to a victim. Um, how should this situation be handled? Um, Malachi, I think you were you were go you were going to answer that question there, were you? No, but I can, and I would, you know, I would suggest that maybe there's a incremental immersion into feminist theory for that person. So he, I presume, it's a he would begin to understand the dynamics of how unhealthy those um, behaviors are. Yeah, yeah. Can I come in there, John, briefly? Absolutely. Um, yeah, that question sounds to me like the the victim sounds very isolated like perhaps it's in a work environment where she believes that it's happening but people aren't seeing it that it is that sneaky type of um you know chip away behavior and if it is for me it's about getting allies so for that woman in the first instance to not feel isolated to ensure that other people see the behavior and then have conversations with them so that she has support and then it's about that person being educated whether it's i would have my doubts uh, maliki but immersing them in feminist theory would be great but try getting them to 
immerse themselves, but maybe it's about then ensuring that maybe the workplace environment can provide broad learning for everybody, but in a way that ensures that he hears that message and that can start conversations. And for me, the learning in UCC has not just been my learning, me bringing learning or Robert's work, but it's about the conversations that result from it amongst the peers. So, you know, you're 42, Malky, I trump you with 46, and there's only so much they listen to from me. But if I know that they're sitting around the restaurant talking to each other about the stuff they've heard in Bystander or heard from Robert, that's the key learning. So I think in that situation, it's about starting those normalizing the conversations in that workplace, which he will then have to become a part of. And that may more subtly um, make a difference. Um, if I could just suggest as well, because I do I do some work in the area of um, domestic violence that I, I've put up I put up some resources there in the chat as well. So uh, if anybody is in that situation, uh, I would I would urge. I mean, domestic violence and domestic abuse thrives in isolation. Um, uh, so and in silence, uh, as all as everything we've been talking about for the last hour does. So reach out and get some help. Um, there are perpetrator programs out there. Um, you know, uh, for for men who do feel they want to make a change. Um, there's quite a process. It's not easy, um, nor should it be. But there is an avenue for those men who are um, willing to take on board to change to be, to be safer people to be around. Um, I'll just finish. I think there's one last comment. And then I know, I know there's other business, so I, I do want to finish on this. Um, it's not a question. It's, oh, it's for Colette, actually, um, from Oscar. I would be really grateful if some resources from Colette uh, discussion on post GDP economies. Um, Colette, if you'd be maybe willing to, to share some information. Uh, it's from Os Oscar. Um, so maybe you could private message each other or send a message there through this chat. Yeah, sure, yeah. With some resources there, Colette, that, that, that would be great. Um, so listen, I, I know we've run over time, um, but not too much. And I think it was a really important discussion and I'm very grateful for the four uh, panelists um, I'm always inspired uh, by, um, I, I, know, I know you all, I know Malachi now. Um, so that's, you know, it's great to meet you, Malachi. I know, I know Louise and Colette and Robert have worked closely with uh, Robert and, uh, and Louise uh, recently. So I thank you for your time. Saturday is a precious time, I know, and thanks for your time. And, uh, you know, hopefully this will be the start of a conversation. And I know speaking, I don't speak on behalf of the Just Transition Greens, but it is a, it is a, central core value for you know any action on climate and biodiversity has to be uh, women have to be front and center of that and you know that we, we will take it on okay thanks thanks guys thanks everyone for contributing there and um, I'll be in touch soon okay thanks John thanks thanks John thanks John thanks everyone bye now Thank you.